Phoenix Suns win over the Minnesota Timberwolves on Friday night may not have been their best win. We can discuss and debate that. What it was for sure was their most confident win of the season. On today's episode of Locked on Suns, where that confidence came from and why it's so important. Let's go. You are Locked on Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons, a writer at Dime Magazine, the host of the Just Basketball Show, wherever you get your podcasts, and I create written and video content for the Locked On Suns insiders. You can join by clicking the link in the show description below. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen to start off your Saturday, maybe your a late riser. I wanted to rewatch the game. So here we are. Thank you for finding us wherever you find your podcasts. We are free and available everywhere, including YouTube. So just hit that follow or subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you use. And there will be a new episode for you every single Monday through Friday. You can become an every dayer here with the show and get locked onto the Phoenix Suns all season long. Today's show brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets. With any winning $5 bet, that's 200 bucks straight to your account if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. All right, so the final score was 97 to 87, but that honestly does not tell the entire story. The Suns led by 16 heading into the fourth quarter. They led by 20 at various points of this game and were up 16 at halftime. So a wire-to-wire win over the Wolves, and sometimes on these next day shows, I do not always pick a moment of the game as we really kind of zoom out and talk about what the game means, but in this case, the moment of the game is exactly, shows exactly what this game meant, and it is the first five, six minutes of this game when the Suns were able to extend out to a 15 to nothing lead. Uh, to be precise, the first four and a half minutes of the game, They were up 15 to nothing, and they did it with their defense. They did it by, I mean, they held Minnesota at the end of the game to the fewest points they scored all season, the lowest shooting percentage they scored all season, had all season, I believe, as well as the lowest points allowed by the Suns. So it was not only the worst offensive game by Minnesota, it was also the best defensive game by the Suns. No matter how you split it up, everything was working. And this first few minutes set the tone for that. It can feel a little bit, I guess, basic, right? Like sometimes you talk about defense and you end up talking about things that feel uh, like middle school basketball practice, right? I mean, there is some sophisticated stuff that the Suns have slowly been able to implement, I would say, but at the ba- at the bare level, what really jumps watching this team lately is effort and communication and execution. But what that allows you to do is to get to that more sophisticated stuff, is to take risks, force turnovers, implement more um, complicated game plans, Right, So in the next segment, we can get to the confidence aspect of this in depth. But what I wanted to really just hit on first is the game, this, this game and what, how it kind of showed up, okay? So I joked on Twitter, right, that you can make, you could make an ASMR file, an ASMR track of the Sun's defensive communication. You turn on these games and it's like even over the hum of the crowd in the background of the broadcast, even over the, you know, sweet tones of Kevin Ray and Eddie Johnson and Sophie Cunningham, you can hear talking. And uh, beyond that, you can see pointing, right? I think a great example illustration of this is something the Suns have been inconsistent with all season, which is early help on a pick and roll, 
basic thing, right? Not not anything too significant, not any uh, complicated offensive set that they're trying to guard against, but it's something they have to do being undersized. I think a good example of this elsewhere, if you're kind of trying to think through what it looks like, is Denver. Denver is a team that over and pre-rotates to an extreme degree to kind of protect against Nikola Jokic and his limitations, the way that he guards, and the fact that they don't want him to have to switch or be exposed. The Suns don't quite have to go that far. I think Nurkic is a little more mobile, a little more athletic than Jokic, probably a better defender overall, but because the Suns are so small, it helps them to do it, right? So a lot of the time, if they're able to have it where Kevin Durant is the low man helper, it's pretty easy because he's seven feet tall. He's a good rim protector, but even that's been inconsistent despite his obvious ability to do it. And that's why it flashes at various points this season when he's had some of these weak side blocks. It's like, damn, where has that been? Well, I think some of it might be like everybody on this team, some frustration, some holding your head, some, you know, discomfort, we'll say. And Durant, I'm sure, would admit to that. But he obviously knows what he needs to do. And I think the the confidence here and the trust factor that you're seeing this team start to develop allows them to communicate that early, Durant to get in position, and know, hey, I can get in front of the basket. I can get into the paint as the high pick and roll is happening. I'm guarding my man in the corner. I can go help to the paint to take away that roll, maybe take away a lob, help contain a drive. And I don't have to worry about the breakdown from there. I know the guy guarding the wings shooter is going to rotate to the corner and will be good and play out of that, play off of that and recover and still be able to get good defense. That leads to, right, as the domino kind of trickles, uh, that's a mixed metaphor, as the dominoes fall from there, as just a basic example in a pick and roll type of atmosphere, you're seeing better contests. You're seeing more effort closing out to shooters and staying with your man on a downhill drive and just holding your ground without fouling and contesting. Again, these sound like things you would be drilling in a middle school environment, but even at the highest levels, I think it's obvious when we watch this team that the lack of continuity, that the, I mean, lack of continuity having been a new team constructed last summer, and then a way more lack of continuity because of the injuries and the turnover at the deadline with O'Neal coming in and Bull developing and everything else, it's obvious. But from there, you can start to execute a game plan, a little bit more, a more complex game plan. For instance, last night, we see the Suns, it's, it's tough to say so black and white, but I think we can probably agree whoever watched that game they were trying to turn Anthony Edwards into a passer and he was reluctant to do it so he took a couple of ill-advised shots he turned it over he made it hard on himself because he was sort of um well they don't have cats so his mentality going into the game these games is I gotta score I think if the Wolves had come into that game Knowing what the Suns were going to do, maybe if there was a game two of a, of a playoff series in, between these teams, they would say, hey, let's find ways to get our shooters open. Let's maybe have Conley initiate a little bit more. And some of this is what they did as the game went on. But early, the Suns were able to jump on them, force a lot of turnovers by playing against what Ant likes to do. But they only can do that because Bradley Beal is fighting through screens, because the help, as I mentioned a minute ago, is there. Yusuf Nurkic is playing a little bit more loose and and a little bit more, I think, risk with a little more risk to his game as a drop defender, all because the defensive improvements are there, right? Because this team is is developing, because they've played together, because they are finally giving effort, and it's showing. The Suns could not have won a game like this last year, uh, last year, prior to the deadline, prior to a week ago, two weeks ago. I don't know where the inflection point was, but it's noticeable. Now, the last thing is, as I mentioned with Minnesota and even the adjustments that they did sort of make in that third quarter, I do want to just be honest here, and I feel that we've seen now 
Three good defensive performances. I think both of the wins over Denver recently were solid defensive games. But teams aren't used to this right now, right? They are going into these games probably not even expecting that Phoenix is going to dictate much of anything with their defense. But now it's going to be on film. Teams are going to realize the Suns have woken up on that end of the court. Somebody like Beal is an actual difference maker. Durant is maybe more consistent as a helper. The, t- the Suns are switching more. Booker is not getting beaten as often as he was. And Nurkic is gaining confidence. So they're going to be ready for it. And that's where this goes from here. But fortunately, the Suns are not static either. I'm sure they will develop even more confidence playing a game like this, playing a game like they did against New Orleans or against Cleveland. And I think the coaching staff will be ready to add more layers to this down the stretch with the last few games here and into the playoffs. So let's get to where did this confidence come from and what can we look forward to from here? What is it allowing them to do that they couldn't do before? And what could it build upon itself with over the coming weeks? We'll get to all of that in just one moment. First, today's show brought to you by the Amazon Fire TV, your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV Stick, which you can just plug into the TV you have, providing access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. So whether it's opening weekend for baseball, the college basketball tournament's final days, or the regular season wrap-up of pro basketball, you're going to want to have a Fire TV to get hooked up. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, including the Locked On Podcast Network and pro leagues, college conferences, and beyond. Fire TV lets you dive into the analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date in the latest of the world of sports, not to mention news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices by visiting Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. All righty, let's keep it rolling here. Again, 97-87 is the final score. We're going to kind of leave the game behind. What I want to do is talk about confidence, and I... Asked Grayson Allen some good questions about this. Frank Vogel discussed it. Kevin Durant discussed it. Where confidence is coming in on the defensive end, but I even think it's there on the offensive end. Before we get there, a reminder, as we hit the stretch one of the playoffs, I will be amping up the Locked On Suns insider community. Already, anyone who, who signs up is getting exclusive analysis on game days, video watchbacks of one key stretch of every Suns game, as well as updates on injuries, news, and a daily standings watch. You can also respond directly to me. You can ask questions. You can get my thoughts. You can send me stuff you see and more. Be in the know about the Suns all the time. Sign up for the Locked On Suns Insiders by visiting joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Suns or go to the link in the show description below and click it and it'll take you right there. All right, why the confidence has arrived? How did the Suns get here? So two easy things, right? The Suns would not be in this position. Think of it this way. Maybe, and I know this isn't that crazy of a thing to say, but it's worth keeping in mind. Maybe if the Suns had had a relatively healthy season, or at the very least, not had the beginning of their season so greatly interrupted by injuries. You could see the Rockets' loss, the couple of bad Oklahoma City losses, the Bucks' loss, the Spurs' loss. I'm not saying none of those would have happened down the stretch. I mean, just look at Milwaukee and I think Boston have both lost to the Wizards recently. But those types of L's probably would have come early in the season, those embarrassing letdown losses. So just getting more time together, you're kind of seeing this team take its lumps in a way where 
those lo losses are lessons types of moments and all those cliches are kind of happening at a weird point in March and April, whereas for most teams, they happen middle of the season, early season. I'm not saying I fully believe that, but certainly something has been building. And for as many bad L's as they've taken, they've also won a lot of impressive games. So it very well could be the case. They're also settling on, settling on a rotation, right? So whereas early in the season, you know, Jordan Goodwin started games for this team and Nasir Little started games for this team and Kata Bates Diop, half these guys aren't even on the roster anymore, let alone playing. So obviously at a certain point, even when Josh Okogie came back, Frank Vogel said, our rotation is the big three, Allen and Nurkic starting the game, Gordon, Bull, O'Neal, and Eubanks as our guys off the bench. Their minutes may fluctuate based on how they're playing or what the matchup is, but that's our nine, and let's go for it. That, at a certain point, just has to happen, right? It was part of why I think the Suns got a little discombobulated in addition to Durant's injury and the trade and everything else, but down the stretch of last season, Monty could not settle on who in the world he wanted to be playing. Now, the roster may not have given him a lot of good options, but he never just said, this is what we're, this is who we are. And Frank did that to his credit. And I think some of the confidence we're seeing now is just, oh, I know Royce's habits. I know KD's habits. I know Nurk's habits as I'm out there as a player. And I'm going to inevitably be more comfortable. Trust those guys. Even if the talent, you know, maybe in some world, Josh Okogie, you could make a case he's a better fit. Or people can say, why is Thad Young not out there? Well, maybe it's fine to just not have so much change, right? And then... I think getting embarrassed has to probably kick you in the you-know-what. You know, I asked Grayson uh, somewhat of a leading question when I was talking to him about confidence and where that's coming from, and he gave credit to Book that for him, for Book, the communication has been there a lot all season, but that over the past couple of weeks, he's noticed everybody kind of embrace that. I said, hey, is that for, was there any moment, was there any inflection point that you sensed you know, I don't think players like questions like that, but it at least sometimes can get their, their minds going and they think of, well, maybe it was this and everybody's going to have a different answer. Grayson said no, but I would guess that it certainly didn't hurt in terms of motivation to lose all those ugly games lately. But there were moments even as they were losing those ugly games, right? I think the Nuggets wins, as I mentioned, were good examples of that. The Lakers win, I would even say, was a pretty good defensive performance coming out of the All-Star break. So, they're clearly more confident, they clearly communicate more, and they have a trust factor with each other that was not there before. What does that mean? What can they now, if it can stay, which... I want to emphasize as an if, because we've seen this team take steps backward, and I mentioned in the first segment, now that the defensive side of this whole thing is becoming clear and will be on film, it's not going to keep being so easy. But what can they do from here? Let's talk about risk-taking, right? So I think that's a great example. Frank Vogel talked pregame about how Nurkic in particular as that drop defender in those pick-and-roll situ situations has become a lot more confident and comfortable himself. So, you know, I talked in that first segment in a basic pick-and-roll type of situation about the communication and the um, execution of sending that early help Nurkic is going to benefit from that, right? He's going to be able to say, okay, well, you know, as I'm moving my feet and trying to feel out what's going on here and I'm, you know, kind of playing that dance of containing the ball handler while still at least tracking the roll man and is that guy a lob threat? Is that guy a, a, a pocket pass short roll threat? What do I need to be doing? Can I contest the, the, the floater or the jumper or the layup that the ball handler takes? Can I recover to take away a lob or, you know, make that big catch and put it on the ground and, and recover? That's all going to be a lot easier when you know that the other, the structure is sound. And so Nurk, I think there was a great example of a steal slash block that he had on Mike Conley in the first quarter last night around the free throw line where he took a half step forward, 
batted his hand down and it ended up a turnover the other direction. I don't think that play is something that he feels comfortable making early in the season when he his head is on a swivel. He knows there's weak links on the defense. It's a work in progress. He's probably just thinking, my job's to take away the paint. I don't want that big catching it. If the guy gets all the way to the basket, I'll try to block it. Otherwise, forget it. In this case, he's like, you know what? Why don't I challenge Conley here? And it worked. The pre-rotations themselves, obviously, you know, you can start to get more adventurous with that, right? I talked about it with Durant at the basket. That's a very easy one, but what if it is, you know, how you defend Jokic, for instance, loading up, playing off of a shooter um, in the pick and roll. Maybe you are. There was a good example of um, of this on a. It ended up being an open corner three for I believe Nikhil Alexander Walker in the left corner. Some point in the game, uh, I want to say second quarter, maybe uh, third quarter, where. He runs off of a pin down screen, a flare screen to the corner. Book is guarding him. Book tries to jump that screen. uh, I think, you know, a a top lock type of of situation to uh, prevent that. Prevent the eventual shooter from using that screen the right way. Book tries to jump it and he gets caught. They do make that skip pass to the corner before Book is able to kind of recover back. They get an open three. I think they even made it, but I like that play. I like Book taking that risk because what he's doing is knowing personnel, trusting that there was a contest. I believe Allen ended up in a position to at least kind of run out to it, and he jumped off of his man at the last second, recognized it, and got a hand up. And I like it because it it's going to add to the layers of what this team can do. The last, uh, the Nurkic example is a good one. Even that book example is a good one. All this is also going to create more turnovers, just something Vogel teams have always done, but this one hasn't done at a high level so far this year. But when you start to develop that confidence, you're going to take risks. You're going to try for turnovers. I think cleaning up the basics we've hit on, you know, the middle school joke that I keep making, but it's like, If you're able to be confident and comfortable and trust each other, your transition defense is going to be good. You're not going to be as panicked about matchups and leaky uh, uh, situations and everything else. Um, Pace is going to be better. I know that's more of an offensive thing, and I'll move there in a second. But I think the ability to play fast, the ability to play through multiple people, the ability to flow into sets and things, that's all going to be there more. And honestly, this is basic, but I called it a basic for a reason. Entry passing. You can tell, especially with um, Durant, they know where he wants it. Up high. Not up high and out where he loses six feet of ground while he's trying to recover the ball, but up high. Book makes him better now. Nurk makes them better now. And it's a whole different ball game than it was making those passes They're also quicker because they know what they're doing. Confidence, again, right? Um, And lastly, let's talk about the offense really quick. I said around the time that this team's switch flipped the first time, early January, I said what I want to see down the stretch on this for this offense, which quickly gelled into one of the statistically the best ones in the NBA. I said what I want to see is if this team can go from a woe offense to a holy crap offense. And what I meant by that is, can they not only be overwhelming and have shot making and have spacing, but can they they be smart about it? Can they run sets and have options out of those sets and execute it quickly without turning the ball over and whatever? I'm not willing to say we're at, you know, 2022 Chris Paul, Devin Booker, Monty Williams levels of firing on all cylinders yet as we're watching this team. But it is a much better and more sophisticated attack than we are seeing. And that comes from confidence too. You see, they have four players who can initiate offense in the starting lineup. The big three and Nurkic. They run very similar sets, no matter who has the ball, who is screening, who is spacing, who is cutting. That is very difficult to guard. 
because they know what they are, what they're doing. They know what they're reading. They know what they can flip into. If the first action doesn't work, the defense doesn't, they're becoming very unpredictable, very spontaneous and very, very hard to guard. And they're taking advantage of matchups on top of that. Michael Porter Jr. or uh, whatever the case may be. It's adding up to something very scary, and it is because of confidence and trust as well. All right, I packed a lot in there. Let's get to the standings before we wrap up because the Suns are now sole owners of sixth place in the Western Conference, and that might be where they end up. We'll break it down coming up next. First, today's show brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook the official sports betting, par- betting partner of the Lockdown Podcast Network. The sports calendar is loaded, and FanDuel's making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet the tourney, MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash on to get started. Here's the deal. I'm going to look at... Um, women's tournament odds because that is really the only uh sporting event that i personally am all that interested in on sunday south carolina six and a half point favorites i could easily see it being a blowout win for south carolina if i'm being honest um but what i do know that i like is even above south carolina to win which is minus 290 the minus six and a half is minus 110 Camila Cardoso to record a double-double in South Carolina to win. If they're going to win, she's going to get a double-double. Iowa does not have an answer for her. That's plus 118. That's a nice little one for you. Either way, check it all out. NBA, NHL, MLB, tourneys, so much more. Make your first bet a big win and get $200 in bonus bets if you win. Fan duel, America's number one sportsbook. Today's show also brought to you by Robinhood. Robinhood is helping you save for retirement with a 401k, uh, an IRA, if you already have a 401k. Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. Even if you have a 401k, you can still have that IRA. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with that 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match, and Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with that 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of your first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. All right, we are closing out the show here. Let's quickly go through the standings. I want to remind you as well to sign up for the Lockdown Suns Insiders where I'm providing daily Suns standing watch text messages straight to your phone. Not only what the Suns are, where the Suns are, what could change, but also what are the games happening that night that you should keep an eye on in the box score? What are the betting lines and who's in and out of those games injury-wise so you know what's going on in the West every day through the rest of the season. This final week will be a sprint. Stay in the know about the Suns all the time. Sign up at the link in the show description below or visit joinsubtext.com slash locked on Suns. All right. So the Suns are the sixth seed right now. And because they lost the tiebreaker to the Mavs, by the season series, which was two to one in favor of Dallas. And the fact that the Clippers are three games ahead with five to play for Phoenix, the Suns are not likely to move much higher than six, right? Some of those losses, Spurs, Bucks, Thunder, Rockets, that probably is going to be the reason the Suns can't get higher than six. But six is a fine place to be, all things considered. We know the uncertainty of the top of the West, so we don't know who the opponent would even be. And frankly, the Clippers and Mavs are both not great matchups for Phoenix. So if that's going to be the 4-5, maybe going to 6 is, is is not all that bad. You also avoid the play-in, obviously, most importantly. Above that, who are the Suns going to play? Well, let's backtrack actually from there. Part of the other reason the Suns are not going to get 6 
Part of the other reason the Suns are likely to get six, and Basketball Reference gives them a uh, 60, 50.4% chance to be the sixth seed. Part of the other reason for that is the teams below them are now at least a full game below them. So the Suns, of course, play the Pelicans and Kings each again. That is hugely important. Both of those games will be massive. So let's not count our chickens before they're hatched here. But the Pelicans are still without Ingram. They have lost four in a row. They are uh, they came off of a six-game win streak directly into a four-game uh, losing streak. Oh, no. They were four and two, then they've lost four. They're four and six in their last ten. The Kings have lost two straight. They're five and five in their last ten. And they're without both Malik Monk and Kevin Herter for the whole rest of the season. Not a good place to be. So that's that. The teams ahead of them are probably going to stay ahead of them. As long as the Suns can take care of business against the Pelicans and the Kings, they should be able to stay ahead of them. So that brings us to who is going to play the Suns in the first round. Who is going to be the first round opponent up in that three seed? If the Suns are in a good spot to stay at six. Now it's not a lock, but it's a good spot. Right now, the most likely team is the Thunder. Basketball references playoff report, I think is what it's called, playoff probabilities report, gives the Thunder a 50% chance to be the three seed. The biggest wild card is the Nuggets, okay? Because their probabilities are split evenly between one, two, and three. The Nuggets have the... Remaining schedule strength here on Tankathon. The Nuggets play the Wolves one more time. If they win that, that would give them obviously a very good chance at the one seed. But the rest of the Nuggets schedule, that game is on April 10th, by the way. So that is uh, Wednesday of this upcoming week. The rest of the Nuggets schedule is cake. Spurs, Grizzlies, Jazz, and Hawks. So the Nuggets could easily run the table and that would give them the one seed. If they lose to the Wolves, if they sputter against Wembenyama or even the Grizzlies who have given some teams trouble lately, you could see the Nuggets getting the three seed. Basketball reference gives that a 36-ish percent chance of happening. So the Nuggets right now have only a 1% ch- a 28% chance at the one seed. And then they're, the odds for the second and third seed for Denver are actually equivalent. So it's still wide open. The last thing to, to, to note though here is Shea Gilgis Alexander is out with a quad contusion. He banged knees with John Collins of the Jazz uh, a little while ago. And it sounds like there's a chance he could miss the whole rest of the regular season. And that sounds extreme. It's only a week left, right? So he very well could not play a factor, and that would obviously decrease what Oklahoma City is working with. They play the Bucks, the Mavs, and the Kings, and the Spurs the rest of the way. Their only sure win, I would say, is the Hornets. So without Shea, you could easily see them dropping games to Milwaukee, Dallas, or Sacramento. As for the Wolves, you know, we know Cat is out. Jamal Murray is also out for the Nuggets, so keep that in mind. The Wolves have Denver, Obviously, I just mentioned that. The Suns the last day of the season, the Lakers in there, and then the Wizards and the Hawks. So, a little tougher. Bottom line is, we don't know who the Suns will play in the first round. The most likely is the most difficult, which is Oklahoma City. But root for Denver, I would say, in that um, Wednesday matchup against Minnesota, so that Maybe Minnesota could fall. They get they have a 12.5% chance at the three seed. Crazier things have happened. And brace yourselves for a Thunder matchup. All right, that will wrap us up. Hope you enjoy the bonus episode here on the weekend. Too good of a game not to talk about. Don't forget to sign up for the Lockdown Suns Insiders where you can get game day analysis, daily standings checks, a video after every game breaking down the key stretch that decided that game. 
You can respond to me. I'll do mailbags and Q&As, maybe some bonus episodes for the insiders as the playoffs go along. All that good stuff. Support the show. You know, that's always a good one too. Enjoy your Saturday. Enjoy your Sunday. We'll be back after Suns Pelicans on Sunday with Brandon Duenas. And I'll talk to you then.